Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session by Scalar. In this session, we're going to look into communication and more about soft skills. So now before we move on with the session, please make sure to subscribe to Scalar's YouTube channel and also hit the bell icon to not miss our upcoming videos. If you also want to learn frameworks and technologies from industry experts, we are conducting free masterclasses and that link is available in the description box below. Now let's look into the topics that will be covered in this session. To start off with, we'll be looking into the soft skills that every single software engineer needs. So once we cover that, we'll move on to how to communicate effectively. We'll also cover how to communicate effectively in two different ways. One is remote working and one is in-person interviews as well. So these are the things that we'll be covering in this particular session. Now without any further ado, let's begin. Communication. Yes, that's correct. But have you ever thought that communication is not a one-way street where a person keeps on speaking? It involves two parties, a listener and a speaker, and both of them are equally important. I have seen this in a lot of my technical interviews, where the candidate with the best possible technical skills is not able to explain the approach. I have been in that boat. I lost a lot of my technical interviews because of this one little glitch. I was not able to explain my approaches properly. Also. It's not just about verbal communication. There are different ways of communication, non-verbal communication, written communication, and so on. Candidate with the best possible verbal communication skills are not able to convert their thoughts, their ideas, their designs into a proper demonstrable code. And then let me tell you about my good friend. He is an amazing software engineer, but when it comes to writing design documents, and statements of proof and purpose and some concepts which involves technical writing, he doesn't do it properly. I am sure if he works on those skills, he can have amazing growth as a software engineer. As I mentioned earlier, communication is a two-way road and listening is a very, very important communication skill. The people who listen effectively have an edge over those who just keep on talking. Listen to your colleagues' opinion about different technical options. Listen to the requirements and needs of your user. This will widen your perspective. I have seen a lot of times in technical interviews that the candidate is so engrossed in solving the problem that they don't listen to the interviewer. The interviewer is saying something trying to course correct them, but they are on their own journey and ultimately solve a problem which they are not supposed to. So make sure that you listen with clarity communicate effectively and speak with confidence. Communication is a secret weapon of yours. So make sure you keep on sharpening it. Being a software developer, it's really important for you to be as much open-minded as possible and also be adaptive. In some situations, both of them may mean different things. They may rotate in cycles going together and in some of them, they perhaps mean the same thing. On this occasion, I remember a famous quote by Steve Jobs. Stay hungry, stay foolish. In an essence, what he meant was you to be as much open-minded as possible. The people who are open-minded, they are receptive to others' feedback. They listen and appreciate and value the feedback given by other people, identify their weaknesses and work on them. So if you are open-minded, it gives you an edge over other software engineers. Let me give you an example from one of my technical interviews. I was the candidate and Google was the company where I was interviewing. So I gave a solution in which I used dynamic programming as the core approach. Down the lane, I realized that, okay, this is not going to work. I was adaptive enough and quick to change my solution and came up with breadth first search based solution. And I was able to solve the problem correctly. Had I been stubborn at that point, who knows? I wouldn't even be here communicating with you all. So in an essence, make sure that you are receptive to other people's feedback and open-minded enough. Because as you climb the ladders of software engineering levels, this is going to be very, very important for you. All the leaders, those who are principal software engineers, engineering managers, and so on. One thing which distinguishes them from other software engineers is that they are very open-minded. They are receptive to so many new technical options that they are able to create the best possible products in their field. To be honest, I am a very restless person, but being a software engineer has helped me become more patient with myself and people around me. My mother thinks that being a software engineer, what do I do? Sit in front of a laptop and get my salary at the end of the month. But software engineering is not an easy thing. It's a very complex feat. 
Let me explain you a typical software engineering cycle. It starts with the product manager gathering the product requirements. We as software engineers reviewing them and going through multiple iterations of that. Then going on with our high level design, low level design, getting them reviewed by your peers, then jumping on to the coding plan, coming with a testing plan and then creating the test suit and so on. It involves so many processes that I am tired right now speaking about them. But being patient is going to be your friend in this mission of software engineering. Let me walk you through a very funny interesting story. One day I pinged one of my colleague for some help on my testing plan. His reply was that his laptop is apparently burning and please contact me after some time. So after four hours I was like hey buddy is your laptop all right and we both had a really good laugh. So ultimately the most important person who you should be patient with is you yourself. Only when you are patient with yourself that you will be able to be patient with others. You will be able to be patient with the environment around you. And once you are patient and acceptive of everything around you, you will have a sharp mental stability which is unmatchable. So being patient is going to be super helpful for you in this long strenuous journey. Even right now I am waiting on some of my colleagues to review my code changes that I have submitted a month back. So give yourself some space to commit some mistakes to fix them and grow as an amazing software engineer. Management is a very crucial soft skill for software engineers. As a software engineer you will be involved in different levels of management. As a fresher you will begin with time management. You will be involved in so many subtasks at a time that you will get confused which one to prioritize over the other. Then as you move up the ladder you will realize that project management is very very important. You will be scoping your project setting deadlines and make sure you put in 100% efforts to meet those deadlines. It's okay if you say this task will be completed in two weeks and you need three more days. But even after those three days if you are not able to complete that task we obviously need to talk. Another thing which I have found as a part of project management very very important is not to say yes to everything. Because if you say yes to everyone you are bound to disappoint a lot of people. So saying no is a very helpful and a healthy skill. Also as you move up the ladder you will be involved in managing different teams people and so on. But being a junior software engineer I am not the one to comment on that. Do you think you can be a successful software engineer being a lone wolf? Software engineering is a team sport. You will be collaborating with a lot of people throughout this journey of project completion. You will work with product managers, your colleagues to get your design and code reviewed. You will be working with testing engineers, getting privacy consultations, security consultations. Whew, you will be collaborating with a lot of people. All in all, I am saying is that you should be someone who is happy and good to be working with. Let me share an interview experience of mine with you. It was my third interview with Google and me and the interviewer we both were trying to solve a product together. We both were sharing some approaches. He was sharing his approach. I was trying to course correct him. I was sharing my approach and he was trying to correct me. We both moved together as a team and it was a great fun experience for me. Being at Google I have learned one thing. You won't succeed if your team doesn't succeed. So make sure in order to grow as a software engineer your team is growing with you as well. A lot of times candidates ask me this one question. Bhaiya what is the important skill to get into top tech companies? I will tell you one secret and you already know that. To get into top tech companies or any other company whatsoever being a good problem solver with critical thinking is utmost important. As an interviewer all I am looking for is an amazing problem solver. Yes the solution is of importance to me but something which is more important than that is how you came up with that approach. That is what I am looking for. Because as a software engineer you will be dealing with problems of different levels of complexity. So how you break that problem down into simpler sub problems and how you deal with ambiguity that's what is going to define you as a software engineer. A wise man once said to err is to human. This means that if you are accountable if you can accept your mistakes you can grow as a human being and moreover as a software engineer in this case. 
In our day-to-day -day daily life, we make a lot of mistakes. Obviously, as a software engineers, we make more mistakes. But it's important to take ownership of the tasks that you are doing and obviously ownership of the mistakes that you are making. In one of my technical interviews, it happened with me that I made a mistake, I accepted it, I apologized, moved on and came up with the correct solution. I took ownership of my solution and the mistake that I did. I think that being humble in one way or other is in confluence with being accountable. Yes, I have seen that the senior software engineers who have 15 years of experience or 10 years of experience as well, they are the most humble software engineers around me. If I lean into you for a secret, when I joined my office, I was very, very scared to communicate with the senior software engineers. I was like, will they give any importance to me? Will they accept the solutions which I'm providing? Will they accept the technical diversity I'm bringing to the table? And to my surprisement, I was astonished to see that they were the people who listened the most, who were the most humble software engineers around me. And that is the reason they are the leaders that they are at the moment. So stay humble, be accountable of your mistakes that will help you become a better human being and obviously a better software engineer. At Google, we follow a blameless culture. Yes, Googlers also make mistakes, but who made the mistake is not of importance. What mistake was done? How did we recover from it? Where were we lucky? And how can we ensure that the mistake is not repeated in future? That is of utmost importance to us. That has helped us become more fearless and creative software engineers. What differentiates us from robots? Emotional awareness, emotional intelligence, and whatnot. As a software engineer, you will build products, you will build items which are ultimately going to be used by your customers who are human beings. So it's a fun fact which is very common in software engineering. It's that your customer is never going to use your product the way you intend them to use. Okay, that might be a bit of exaggeration, but if you prepare for 10 use cases which you intend the user to use your product like, the customer will come up with some innovative 11th use case and ultimately defy the purpose of your software development. So it's really important to understand what emotion is driving your user to behave in a particular way so that you can build better products for your customers because ultimately your victory is when the customer wins. Apart from customer's perspective, Let's look at empathy from the point of view of teamwork and collaboration. More often, being a software engineer, you are going to work in teams where there are people from diverse backgrounds. So make sure that you respect their belief systems, accept whatever technical options and variety that they bring onto the table. This will enable you to do your job in a better way. A very important part of people's skills is being approachable. I have seen a lot of software engineers who grew more than others only because they were more approachable and helpful than others. The project that I'm currently working on at Google, I'm trying to integrate a new piece of infrastructure with my team's code base. And the software engineer with whom I'm collaborating, she is so, so helpful and approachable that she always goes beyond the edge, beyond what is assigned to her to make sure I have an amazing experience. A lot often you will realize that the success of a project depends on the software engineer who is working on that project. You know why? Because it correlates with the right personality of the software engineer. But remember, being approachable doesn't mean you say yes to everyone. As you remember my earlier point, if you say yes to everyone and every ask that a person needs help for, you are likely to disappoint a lot of people. So a little bit of moderation with some yes and no's and being helpful and approachable will help you grow as a software engineer. And that's what I have seen in one of my close friends. He is so sweet and so approachable that he almost always says yes to everyone who needs help around him. And I have seen him grow more than any other software engineer that I have seen around me. So make sure you are friendly, empathetic and approachable to everyone around you in a team collaborative environment. Our software industry is growing at a very rapid pace. So if you are missing out on self-learning new technologies and new languages, you are not going to progress as a software engineer. Curiosity is one such soft skill, which will be your friend in your journey of self-learning new things. 
Let me tell you an interesting experience with one of the candidates I interviewed recently. I provided that candidate with a problem and he went above and beyond to identify the root cause of the problem and came up with a more effective and a better solution than what I was expecting from him. Another example of me and my close friend. I am someone who minds my own business, looks at the problem, identifies the solution and comes up with a mitigating way. He is someone who goes above and beyond to identify what actually caused the root cause of the problem, tries to find some supporting ways in which he can also make the code base somewhat better than the current situation, solves the problem and also helps the software engineers around him. It is this habit of his to be more curious, to be more explorative than what is expected of him that has made him a technical dependable teammate who most of the people in my team approach for. So be a little more curious about the problem you are working on, be a little more explorative about the code base, about why a customer needs a particular feature, about what technical solutions may be more beneficial than the current state of the art of the technology and I am sure you will lean on a super beneficial software engineering journey. By now, I am sure you are starting to pick up a pattern. All of these soft skills are interrelated with each other and they complement together to a successful dynamite package of a software engineer. Hi, my name is Yash and in this video, I will communicate with you about how you can communicate with others at home and at work better particularly if you are a software engineer in your one, two or three of your career. We'll cover three topics. One, why is communication important for your career growth? Two, how can you communicate better? And three, a checklist that you can use right after this video. Why is this video going to be slightly different? Because what we'll try to do is take a logical explanation that sticks with you, regardless of the many frameworks that exist, that is underlying the frameworks. And two, we'll take examples that hopefully you can relate to. Let's dive into it. Let's talk about why communication is so important for your career growth. We talk about this with a simple tabular example to compare an SD1, maybe in year one or two of their career, with a CTO or an engineering manager, uh, anywhere between the fifth to tenth year mark of their career. And we'll use three parameters to give you a sense of exactly why people keep saying communication is important and you should work on it now rather than later. But hold on a second. Communication is important is fairly obvious to everyone. It's like saying exercise is important, right? Doesn't everyone agree? Yes. Uh, can everyone explain it in a way that they believe it? Maybe. Does everyone do exercise or does everyone work on their communication? Maybe not. Well, that's exactly why we're going to talk about the three parameters. So let's talk about the CTO versus the SD1 along three parameters. The first is the amount of time spent. As an SD1, you're probably spending five to 10 hours out of a 50 hour week on communicating. But as an, as an engineer, manager, or as a CTO, you're probably spending 20 to even 30 hours out of a 50 hour week on just communicating in various forms, written, uh, spoken, and written can also be on email, on Slack, uh, on WhatsApp. It can be requirement documents, technical specifications, and so on and so forth. So the amount of time spent can go up from in the five to 10 hour range, maybe from 10 hours to 25 hours, that's a 2.5 X jump. And that's huge. That defines half your job now as an engineering manager. So number one parameter, time spent massively changes as you grow in your career. Number two parameter, the rupee value could be the dollar value as well. But what's important to internalize here is that an SD one may be working on uh, the typography or the front end flow of a page that perhaps has a few thousand rupees of implication of risk associated with it if it goes wrong. But a CTO carries the risk of entire products themselves and groups of products. For example, if there's a huge referral product for the B2B partners and that goes wrong or is communicated wrong, then that has a multi crore rupee risk. So the amount of rupee risk that multiplies exponentially. Time multiplies uh, in terms of you know 2.53x, 4x from an SD1 to a CTO, but the amount of rupee risk that multiplies exponentially. That's the second parameter for why communication is important. The third parameter, and this is something that we often underestimate, at least I have seen that, is the audience parameter. And this is the dimensions and types of audience. As an SD1, you're probably limited to 90% of your time spent with an internal audience that is a combination of three stakeholders. Perhaps your peers, 
uh, your manager, uh, and then maybe uh, there's HR. Uh, other than that, there is not much work communication going on with stakeholders. But as a CTO, communication is with internal audiences as well as external audiences. Within internal audiences, there are functions to communicate with. There is a business team, there is a product team, uh, there is a marketing team. There could also be communication with the sales team. There could be communication with the HR and the recruitment team about organizing the team and hiring more people. There could be communication with the founders. There could be communication with the CEO. There are just many dimensions of internal communication and each stakeholder internally will receive the message and interpret the message differently. So the CTO will have to modify his or her style to meet the needs of getting the message across to the internal stakeholders. So that's one dimension that increases significantly. The other dimension for the CTO is the external dimension. He or she may have to actually talk to the board of the company or a bunch of users or write a blog on LinkedIn about the company. And so the degree of external uh, interactions and audiences changes and magnifies. So does the degree and number of internal audiences. To summarize, the third variable is audience. As an SD1, your audience is limited, but as a CTO, your audience is exponential, internal and external. So you need to be able to modify your style, which is why those three variables show that as an engineer in your early career, the time spent is low, the rupee value is low, the audience is also limited. But as a CTO, the time spent is massive. From 10 hours, you go to 25 hours, the rupee value goes from a few thousand rupees to crores of rupees. And the audiences go from three or four stakeholders to maybe 15 or 20 stakeholders. And so communication becomes really important, which is why if you look at the skill of communication and how most leaders see it, you plot on the x-axis years of experience, on the y-axis communication skill, and most believe that the graph should always flow upward. What changes, however, is the nuance of the gradient. If you're working in a context which is slightly more multicultural, like you're working in a B2B SaaS tech startup uh, with clients in the US, then the gradient may be sharper. Because as a manager, you may already have to be very, very clear and crisp in your communication. Whereas if you're working in a more local context, the gradient may be flatter. Regardless, the gradient is always upward. And because time, rupee value, and audiences magnify as you grow in your career, communication is really important. And that's something you should internalize right now. So maybe now you can explain why exercise is important. So how can you communicate better? Maybe you should be more polite. Maybe you should use a flowery language. Maybe you should speak really fast. Maybe you should work on your pitch, tone, clarity, pace, amplitude, diction. Maybe you should just follow that amazing picture on, on Google search, which was some Harvard-esque method of communicating better. All of that may be right and all of that may be wrong. What I'm going to tell you is the underlying logic, which if you understand and use, no matter what framework you use, you'll be fine. And that logic is the following. Perfect communication is equal to message intended, is equal to message sent, is equal to message delivered with the least number of words or energy possible. Let me repeat. Message intended is equal to message sent, is equal to message delivered. How often is this equation really true? Most times you'll notice that you had some other intention in mind. The message came out in a certain way and the message was interpreted and received in a certain way. The biggest problem with communication is the loss of meaning at every stage from thought to delivery to the recipient taking it in. And that loss of meaning is exactly like in any physics construct, you have loss of energy from different stages. So if you solve to keep that chain tight and you'll never get to 100%, maybe you'll get to 70, 80, 90%, you'll be fine with whichever framework you use. So that's the golden equation to remember. Now, how specifically can you understand this and use it already today? Let's take an example, a not so good example, a good example. Uh, if you're an SD1 working on a certain product feature and that's delayed, uh, then the not so good example is you send the message uh, to your product manager saying, hey, listen, this is delayed. It'll take two more days. And then the product manager asks you why. And then you explain, oh, listen, the API integration didn't happen so smoothly. Uh, and then the product manager asks you, hey, have you looked at other techniques or other kinds of tools to integrate with? And then you'll say, hey, we looked at this, uh, but then it's still not very, very easy. And, uh, you know, we, we think this is still the best one, so it'll take two more days. And then be like, okay, are there other dependent tasks that I should inform others about uh, that depend on your completion of this? And you'll be like, hi, oh, yeah, 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 let's let's inform this other team about, you know, the design piece they're building and that will have to delay a little bit. And then be like, okay. So you went through four loops of communication to explain why there would be a certain delay. Now that is, gets the job done, but it's too many loops and it's not very comfortable as an experience for you or the product manager. On the other hand, a good example is the following. You can 
already anticipate and solve for what the message received should be. So for example, if the message received should be uh, the product manager understanding why there's a delay, by how long there'll be a delay, two days, uh, who else is affected by the delay, how he can therefore plan better, and what are the things you are already doing to make sure there are no further delays, then we're fine. So the good example is when you say, hey, listen, there's a two day delay because the API integration is not going well. We've looked at many other API options. This is the best one. Uh, as a result of this, there may be the design team whose work can be two day more affected. And so we should inform them right now. Alternatively, to make sure that there is no further delay, we have a backup as well in case this one doesn't work and two engineers are working in parallel so that no matter what happens by two days, things go live. If you have any inputs, please let us know. Now, this is the message required. And if you solve for this, then you've already solve the message intended and the message sent in a way that it should be received. And there is no loop here. It's just one clean loop, maximum two, if he asks you a follow-up question. So this is an example of how you can use the golden equation to communicate better. Uh, I will also share one more, uh, what I have discovered as a, as a hack. Uh, usually, if you are using verbal communication, you can use a combination of variables such as pitch, tone, pace, clarity, amplitude. Now, this is almost a set of tools to use. Your pitch is how uh, you know high or how low you go. Your pace is how fast you go or how slow you go. Your tone can be uh, different. It can be serious. It can be very, very funny. Uh, clarity is about how well you're pronouncing the word so that it's clearly audible. Uh, and amplitude is, of course, how loud you are or how soft you are. And so if you play with these, because you have a default setting, it's like you're a thermometer or a, or a tool. Each of us is and has a default setting. If you play with the verbals, then you're sometimes the message sent gets received better and that that loss of meaning is reduced. So let me summarize. How can you communicate better? Uh, we used a not so good example of multiple loops of communication and lack of clarity. Uh, and we used a single loop example of a good communication with the product manager where everything was said in one go uh, in a very clear way. Uh, and this is an example of how, therefore, if you think about the three parts of the golden equation, you will communicate better no matter what tool or framework you use. Of course, the voice variables are an add-on for you free to use, pitch, tone, clarity, pace, amplitude, play with them, find your own style, and eventually you'll see that the more you intend is what exactly is sent is what exactly is received. And over time, you'll get better and better. Let's recap. So far, we've talked about two topics out of the three. Why is communication important? We've talked about three parameters. How as you grow in your career, the amount of time, you're communicating, the Ruby value associated with your communication, as well as the amount and type of audiences that you have to communicate with. All of that grows and therefore communication becomes more and more important as you grow. Number two, we've talked about how you can communicate better. Uh, we've touched upon the golden equation after which you can use any framework and that equation is the message intended is equal to the message sent is equal to the message delivered. Uh, and number three, we'll now cover in the last 30 seconds a checklist that you can use to communicate better starting right after this video. What is that checklist? Five simple things. Remember the audience, the message you intend for them to receive, the medium you want to send it in, text, call. Make sure you spell check before you send it. And finally, make sure that you follow up after it has been received so that you make sure that they have understood what you wanted them to understand. If you do these five things and you do it consistently over time, your communication will start showing improvement day by day, year by year, and you'll see those gains uh, that will then show up in ways where people start seeing you differently and in a better light. This video was just the tip of the iceberg in communication and soft skills content. If there are more topics you want us to cover or specific questions you have, please comment below. We'll definitely respond uh, in our quest to make you the best engineer that you can be. Hi. I, um, myself, my name, uh, um, um, yes, yes, uh, uh, relax guys, I don't speak like that, but if you do and are not able to communicate well in English and this makes you do not crack the interviews, you find it difficult to hold conversations with your colleagues at workplace. You're unable to deliver speeches, give presentations and address large gatherings and find it difficult to settle abroad because of poor spoken English or are even not able to look for an opportunity out of English. For example, motivational speaker, career coach, public speaker or any other kind of orator. 
then this video is exactly for you. Hi once again and I'm Vandita Shukla, research analyst at Scalar Academy and today I'm going to tell you how to speak confidently and fluently in English with zero investment, zero coaching classes and with six basic golden tips. But first of all, we need to understand that English is just any other language. So if you are able to communicate well in your native language, it means learning spoken English would be just a piece of cake for you. So don't worry, quit all your fears and begin learning spoken English. So the first tip is reading. Start reading newspapers, newspaper headlines or maybe the detailed news, your novels, books, even the pamphlets that you get at your home or the restaurant menu. Anything and everything that comes in your hand, begin reading it. At times you will find it difficult to pronounce certain words. You would be reading certain words for the very first time. Refer a dictionary or Google search them. Take the help of voice assistant and get the exact pronunciations. This will improve your spoken English from basic level and will also enhance your vocabulary. So there are two things that you're getting just by reading. Tip number two is Netflix and chill. Do not worry guys, Netflix and Spotify can actually enhance your spoken English. Tune into any English Hollywood movie or any English song and just follow three basic steps to improve your spoken English. Step number one, listen and decipher. So when you're listening to a song or you're watching a movie, try to decipher the words the speaker says and understand them. And in the step number two, that is to speak along, try to speak with the speaker. You could do it from the first hand or you could just listen to the movie at the very first time and speak at the second time when you're watching it. You can pause, you can repeat as many times as you want, but get the pronunciations right. In the step number three, you are not allowed to stop the video, repeat the video. You just have to match the pace, match the delivery, get the expressions right. Now what will happen is you will learn to pronounce words and you will also get the delivery. You will get the vocal variety, different kinds of expressions, pitches, tones, modulations and you will speak like any native speaker that is from America or any parts of the Europe. Tip number three is to think in English. For example, you're going to a restaurant and you have to order a burger. Will you say, Bhaiya, burger hai kya? No, right? You would try to say, Hey, can I get a burger? How will this happen? Some of the people try to think these kind of sentences in their mind, in their native language, and then convert it to English. But this process is not going to help you in the long run. Instead, try to frame sentences and compose them in English first hand. It will be difficult, but slowly and suddenly you will get how to think in English and then deliver. Because science says what you think, you act. So start thinking in English. Tip number four, talk to yourself. You are the best audience that you can ever get. Stand before a mirror, before any D-Day, for example, your interview or the day of presentation, get the content and rehearse it. You will get prepared for the relevant questions that the audience can put up for the content that you have delivered and you will get the answers as well. This will build your confidence to an immense level because now you have rehearsed how to deliver and you know how to pronounce certain words and you know the relative questions that can be put up. So just stand before your mirror and rehearse. Practice, practice and practice. Step number five. 
participate. What are you waiting for? You're sitting with your family or your colleagues and you're discussing maybe today's political issues or the rise in petrol prices. But remember, all the conversations have to be initiated in English. Your friends might mock at you. Your family may not like it. But it is for your own personal growth. So start speaking in English and participating in conversations in English for the very first time. You can even take part in the contest, for example, Model United Nations or certain debates that happen in institutions or any other platform. You could even participate in spill poetry sessions or any stand-up comedy sessions as well. But remember, everything in English. There are certain public speaking clubs like Rotra Toastmasters which invite guests for free and give them a platform to speak in English. You can try them as well. Just Google it. Tip number six. Speak with me. She sells seashells on a seashore. You must be thinking that I'm here just to fun. No, right? This is a tongue twister. You can get similar tongue twisters from Google. Try repeating them as many times as you want. This will give you a definite kind of pace and a clarity just like a native speaker. You get it? These simple six golden tips can help you improve your spoken English to a much greater level. Because it's not just about clearing the interview. It's also about leading a team at your workplace. And this will only happen when you communicate well. There are millions of opportunities waiting for you if you get spoken English right. If you have any comment, any feedback for the tips that I've shared, or you know some other tips that can improve spoken English, do put them on a comment section below. And for any other relative career tips or some other aspects that you want to know that can help you boost your programming or your career in software engineering, Skiller Academy is the best place. Keep viewing. Keep subscribing and share as much as you want. Bye-bye. Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another video by Scalar in regards to interview segment. We know you are all worked up and trying to get your preparation game tight to crack the next interview. Don't worry, we got you covered. If you are trying to tap your fluency during the interview, you have landed on the right video. But before we get into the drill, do make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on more preppy videos by Scalar. Alright, so we understand it gets a little awkward when you are addressing people you have never met before with holding the power to choose you for their firm. It surely is intimidating. Like it was before I got in front of this camera, knowing I'm going to speak to a camera that will make my voice reach out to people I don't even know. It is awkward. It is worrying because the way we humans are wired, we judge ourselves before anyone else has the opportunity to judge us. So we play what we want to say in our heads before we say it out loud. And boom, there goes our fluency in vain. But don't you worry, it's not just you, it's the contemplation that is very common with us. The urge to sound smart and confident is also the reason to not be able to sound like one because we get caught up in the thought of it. So this is exactly why we are here to prepare our minds to not give in to the momentary fears and awkwardness and let our true potential surface as we speak. So let's break down the factors that are involved in order to be fluent in an interview. Starting off with hesitation. You could be lying to us but not yourself that you might have nodded yes to something you didn't know about. Or laughed at a meme that all your friends were laughing at even though you didn't quite catch the joke. Won't lie, been there, done that myself. But all of this is still alright when it's happening around your peers. Make sure you don't hesitate to admit something you don't fully understand or know answers to. Your interviewer is no one but a human after all. We are no Wikipedia to know it all. The moment you hesitate to vocalize something that you don't fully understand, is this going to be downfall of a made up answers from there on. And your interviewer is going to know. Yes, they do say fake it till you make it, but not at the cost of looking stupid after being busted for being fake. So you, my dear friend, don't hesitate opening up about things you don't know. Don't hesitate to ask questions you didn't fully understand at first. But what you could do instead is say, when you don't know an answer to something technical, put yourself in a position of what you would actually do if you had time to figure its meaning out. It's natural. You would sit down and look it up. Research and educate. So just be upfront about it and say what you would do even though you don't know about it now. 
the interviewer will be aware that you are a keen learner and not someone who would be demotivated by just one unknown query. Be verbal and be you. If you are flawed, embrace them so that the interviewer knows that you are not giving into some sort of pretense that might drag you down later. This move will just reflect how headstrong of a personality you have and how much ownership you actually have. But also don't go with this mindset that yes, I will just say I'll do research for every question they are asking. Make sure you save this move for queries that you actually don't know about. Next up, judgment to oneself. This one runs deep into our bones since our very childhood. Be it being on the stage giving your annual day performance or giving answer in front of your entire batch for Vivas or having your relatives request you to perform something. We subconsciously always think about what others might perceive us as. Would we look dumb? Would we look like we are overdoing something? We end up cringing on ourselves way before we actually find out our true potential. And this is what pretty much happens when we enter that room with four walls and the board sitting in front of us waiting for us to form an impression. But honestly, if you thought about it, it's more of a leverage than a drawback. Originally, these individuals know nothing more than what's mentioned in your resume. So you could choose who you want to be. You could be someone none of your friends or family have ever seen. Unleash that side of yourself. Overpower the judgment your mind is throwing at you and just speak of what you would believe is needed to be said. When you are with a group of friends discussing your goals, you don't judge yourself for how unreal a benchmark is set. You have no reason to be afraid in front of your interviewer's judgment towards you. They interview every second person from your field. They come across all sorts of answers. The only way you can leave a significant impression is by being yourself, free from unnecessary judgments. So say goodbye to it. Speaking of goodbyes, this is what you need to say goodbye to. Comparisons. Comparisons won't do any good. We know that the competition out there is insane. With an industry with such a cutthroat competition, you will end up wondering how you are better than your batchmates, let alone the entire set of people in this industry. While a little kick from this competitive approach can boost your urge to learn and excel, you need to understand how to balance this out. Don't compare yourself with the rest, but instead sit down and make a list of skills you possess. Your abilities to perform, how you can function under pressure, how you have functioned as a team player and solo. Focus on the brighter side of things. Tunnel vision will blur out so many possibilities that might work in your favor. Drop that comparison. So what your friend is good with a specific programming language. You see how much you have excelled on your learning and you shall absolutely ace your interview. The only way you can be a true version of yourself and be hired for who you are and the qualities you have is by acknowledging who you truly are and vocalize it in your interview. It is either now or never. This brings us to our fourth point, striking conversations. We get so caught up in impressing the interviewer, we tend to forget how to indulge with the company. Interview may seem like you are the only one entitled to answer questions, but it can honestly flow both ways. Companies not only want to know if you are fit for the role you are offered, but also want to learn if you are inclined towards the company. Your loyalty and dedication will after all root from that inclination. So make sure you make a list of questions you would like to ask your interviewer. Don't focus on the perks of the company that has to offer you, cause eventually you will land the job there and once you do that, you will know what the offers are. But try and build curiosity towards the functioning of it. Go on their website, learn about the people who are involved in the making of the company. Make sure to mention them and drop appreciation by acknowledging their contribution and how you have followed their work. Ask them about their approach and their vision. Respond to it by how you would be able to contribute to achieving that vision. Mention how you are not just focusing on self-growth, but wish to grow with the company. These conversations will help you stand out from the rest because you took that extra mile to learn the company better. You strike conversations with them rather than a QA and a session. Take it from us. A conversation with your interviewer will raise your stakes to be remembered than just another candidate robotically answering questions and leaving the room. We don't want to miss out on our introvert mates, so here's what you can do. If you are an introvert, it's a whole new level of challenge when you are entering a room full of strangers who will judge you on your communicational skills and your ability to vocalize your learning and achievements. We understand that and we don't want you to feel that we don't get how it's slightly more stressful for you than the rest. Don't overthink it. Utilize the time to prepare for unpredictable circumstances beforehand. We all have that one go-to person. Strike fake interview session with them to loosen up a little bit. If you are someone that is uncomfortable even with that, 
try and record yourself while answering questions that you are preparing for notice your body language check if you are looking uncomfortable and try to work on these little details so you don't come off as underconfident on your final day as an introvert random questions can really catch you off guard so make a list of accomplishments that will potentially work as an answer to many common questions try to fit them as a starting response so you can earn some breathing space to make up the rest of your response in your head meanwhile prepare one interview at a time since it can get really taxing to interact with multiple people on same day being an introvert is not a downside of your personality in fact it makes more room for thoughtfulness and creativity when you are in your own zone and less interactive so pick your aces right and mark a remarkable impression by flaunting your learnings and abilities coming down to the most important factor to ensure fluency confidence confidence is your crown you cannot miss out on this factor ever confidence wouldn't be something you'll be able to vocalize like your achievements but something that will reflect as you speak about your skills here are a few basic techniques that will help you come off as a confident individual maintain eye contact with your interviewer it makes the conversation a lot more personal and honest your eyes naturally reflect the emotions you are feeling and eye contact with your interviewer will help them understand the emotions you are talking with have a pleasant smile on your face let them know how humbled and pleased you are to be in the room sharing presence with them don't overdo it though keep it authentic the best version of yourself will only reflect when you are fully embracing yourself keep your body language in check avoid fidgeting don't touch your head too often don't break your knuckles you are nervous you know that we know that but they don't need to know that also make sure that you are aware of your rate of speech it's usually when we are nervous or feeling a rush our rate of speech increases even if you are someone who speaks fast in general make sure you slow down a little so that you are audible and clear don't let your habits cause a misconception in your interviewer's head that you are rushing out of nervousness lastly remember it's not a grammar test no you are not applying for a visa test or an english speaking test for you to be nervous about your language fluency just remind yourself about the fact that english is not our first language and even though it's commonly used it's because communication goes seamless in a professional environment with people coming from different corners of the world when you are responding in english the interviewer is not scaling your skills on the basis of how fluent your language is but they are just trying to see if you can carry out basic communications with it if you end up focusing on sounding grammatically correct you might end up sounding robotic trying to put words together let your talk flow speak value not words if you keep your head caught up in insignificant factors of the interview you might miss out on focusing on other things that truly matter that the interviewer is truly interested in knowing before we wrap the video up we will quickly share a real story that one of my team leader shared with me once on my first job it was a story from his interview with the board he entered the room with a bright smile positive attitude and wished the board good morning that's basic etiquette right one of the members from the board responded what exactly about this morning do you find so good what would you even do with a response like that over a casual morning wish are you going to sit there and frame a sentence to sound smart and correct or let them see your confidence has pretty much sank with that response of them i say be honest that's what my team leader did at the time he didn't try to sound smart or say something creative he simply said i woke up this morning and i had the pleasure to meet you and strike this conversation with you that makes my morning good for me the point is that not everything has to sound smart or has to be related with your work profile or job opportunity some responses also involve talking about you how you will be as an individual in certain situations and not an employee representing a firm so present all possible version of yourself and let the interviewer know you better your flaws and inefficiencies about certain things will be overlooked if you express your passion to learn and improve each day and that's what truly matters to a company now you go and pick your best outfit and your favorite shade of shirt from your wardrobe and is that interview you're panicking about right now we know you got this we really do just take a deep breath stop questioning yourself and start embracing yourself all the love and luck to you we hope you crack that interview for more such prep videos make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so you never miss an update from scaler welcome <laughs> all of you and say a very good evening uh, bhavik and i are back a short introduction and then we cover the topic actually the topic first the topic today is communication 101 in remote work 
people on this session, uh, Bhavik and me. Uh, a little bit about Bhavik. Bhavik is uh, an engineer from IIT Madras. He did mechanical engineering. Uh, for the first couple of years, he was very, very excited about studies uh, and, you know, got the best grades. In the last couple of years, he ran as far away from that as possible, but he could not extricate himself from the desire to perform academically. Uh, and so he landed up in this company called Boston Consulting Group, where he started his career as a management consultant, uh, worked across India for a couple of years, uh, then transitioned to being very, very close, intimate, and uh, very, very involved with Microsoft Excel in Bain Capital, which is a which is one of the most uh, flagship private equity funds in India. Uh, spent many free, sleepless nights there working on uh, financial models, uh, portfolio companies, and the like. Uh, and now he's a BU head at Scalar Academy, where uh, he co-leads along with me and Vedant uh, the entire business uh, for growth and amazing career outcomes. So welcome, Bhavik. Uh, great to have you. As usual, I will not be as kind to you during the rest of this conversation as I have likewise, been in, friend, the last, uh, in the last 80 seconds. With that warning now out of the way, uh, a little bit about me for everyone who might or might not be interested. My name is Yash. Along with Bhavik, I also lead uh, Scalar's business team. Uh, I am not an engineer, so a lot of you might be techies who are watching. Uh, I'm an arts graduate in economics from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. Like Bhavik, I also worked in management consulting in McKinsey and Company, uh, first in the India office for a couple of years, uh, and then in the New York office. Experienced, I would say, more than about uh, you know, 12, 13 different client situations, uh, more than 15 cities easily. Uh, got confused at most points in my, in my career in, in consulting. Uh, decided that I wanted to do something purposeful. Uh, came back to India in 2020, joined Scalar Academy, and have now been uh, tied to this rocket ship with a mission to make it grow uh, and to make a lot of career transformations happen. So thank you so much for joining this session. Bhavik and me will cover a bunch of uh, what I would call a stupid point of views and stupid questions, which may add some value on the idea of communication uh, in a remote work setting. So Bhavik, uh, just in the interest of putting you on the spot, and I know mm -hmm. that we've shared three or four questions with each other, but I also know that I'm not going to pick those. I'm going to pick the ones that I haven't shared with you. Uh, so just to put you in the spot, I will ask you the first question, and then we'll go back and forth. And in uh -huh. case there are any questions from folks, we can take those as well. Cool. So the questions Good, very... we've received from community are, are plenty. And I think the first one is, so Bhavik, how do you manage communication when, uh, when you're on a group call and it's unclear whether you're participating it in it or running it, whether there's audio or video. Essentially, how do you manage communication in a very large group call where things may not be as clear as to what needs to happen? Wow, that's a very, very broad question. <laughs> let's, let's break it down a little bit. You're in a group call, understood that much. Are yeah. you a leader or are you a listener? Which one do you want me to cover? And I'll ask you the other. Uh, one. I would say, what if you're the leader of the call, where you're running the call and there are more mm -hmm. than five people? And you get people to an answer. Got it. Got it. Understood. Perfect. I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, and would love to see people's reactions and comments if you've got further questions on this. But essentially, the work for a group call or a meeting, when you're leading a meeting, starts way before the meeting. It's, it's not something you need to do in the meeting, not even in the 10 minutes before the meeting. Mm -hmm. Typically, if I have a group call, I need to be very clear on what constitutes success from that call. What do I want coming out of this call? If you have that clarity, then everything needs to flow from that. So first I'll sit and think, what do I want to achieve from this call with the people in the room? That can be a variety of things, right? You can say, hey, I mm -hmm. want explicit sign off from everyone that we are all on the mm -hmm. same page. Pick, go ahead, run the show. Or it is a brainstorming call. I want everyone to engage and give me their ideas. That could be another agenda. Third type of agenda could be, I want to give feedback to people about something I've observed lay out a problem statement for them so that they go and think about it after the call. So see, a group call can have many, many goals to it, right? Now, first thing is, highest level, figure out what your goal is from the group call. Then think through what are the points you want to cover to achieve that goal. Just simple list of points. Figure out whether you need any data for proving some of the points, whether you want to bring in some emotion into some of the points to land your message, because your objective is to achieve whatever you define as success. So that's number two. Mm. Number three for me is 
block time for everyone in advance with the agenda mm. no one should come into that call unaware of what mm. to expect so if you're working with people who monitor their calendars strictly put it there if you don't mm. think they do go share it on slack email whatever is a mode of communication in your meeting all of this mind you mm. still before the meeting i've not even entered the meeting yet but i am setting up the ground for the meeting to be successful then once i enter the meeting if it's clear to me that i have to lead it and i need to walk away with certain success i will first walk in and repeat the agenda say it put it into the chat box if you're using google meet there's a chat box on the side say it put it in writing everyone on the same page ask for contribution does anyone have any agenda point you want to add otherwise you're going to stick mm. to this now you've mm. laid the context for everyone after that drive the conversation if anyone bears off agenda respectfully tell mm. them ye baad mein address karte hain we will address this later for now you will stick to this agenda during the meeting mm. especially for long group meetings or meetings with multiple people mm. keep taking pauses asking the people have they understood till now are they aligned on whatever set till now keep circulating the summaries in the chat box on the side no one should have an excuse later to not be aligned or even be confused unintentionally mm. or intentionally after that's done run the meeting clarify everything meeting over job not over after the mm. meeting circulate those takeaways and to do's very clearly again slack email whatever is useful for you why am i doing this long process because i want to achieve something out of the meeting what happens if i don't it screws mm. things up big time because you might put something into action work really hard and a week later someone's not aligned go redo the whole thing or you were mm. lying on two three other stakeholders to do something for you they didn't realize mm. that they that was the expectation for them stuff breaks you wasted your time everyone else's time or time useless so meetings are very powerful or they can be weapons of mass destruction you choose <laughs> that's that's my philosophy got it got it got it so you you're trying to make sure you manage the pre meeting process in a way such that you get enough done in the meeting and then there are in meeting hacks like constant check in alignment on chat making sure people are responsive and then ending with sign off on next steps so your mechanics ensure that your goal if that was sign off or inputs or decision are reached uh yeah. got it got it got it and i think very helpful uh a I lot will, of these simple I things will, uh, it sounds simple but what people i've seen people make a mistake about it these are habits if you miss them one time two time you might not see as much damage but it becomes a bad habit you start missing these over time and all it takes is one mistake for stuff to blow up so building these habits is a tricky bit seems very innocuous but very important correct correct do you also want to talk about the the famous pre read uh, by famous i mean not the entire world but the 300 400 folks scale no uh the the ritual that you instituted after which there has been a significant transformation in our internal you know company wide meetings well, i hope there has been at least people are wary of that when it's a meeting with me luckily but uh sure i can speak to that for a couple of minutes i think there was time back in novemberish where we all realized we were doing too many meetings and not getting enough out of them i think it was something we were feeling it was something the founders were feeling in general that was a sentiment and uh, i realized the problem lies in not doing these small things correctly because all these small things together lead to success right so i think i created a document which was the good meeting checklist uh hmm. which laid out before meeting during meeting after meeting what are the things to do for hmm. people who are new to it use this checklist make sure you're doing it if you do it i promise you the meetings are going to run well if if they run well you will automatically see your productivity improve i don't know if the whole org is adopted it but you know in our immediate vicinity people seem to now be following that right agenda shared take away shared to do shared clear accountability two more yeah. points which actually are more as a absorber or a consumer of a meeting than someone driving it which i would like you to speak about because i know you religiously follow this is the funda of obligation to think and obligation to dissent can you elaborate on that Yeah see I wasn't expecting you to flip a question so soon but now that you have I will remember it for the remainder of these 20 minutes because you know the volleyball can go on and opportunities can be a plenty to put you in the spot uh and and that will be used by me but before I answer the question I think also would love to say hello to the folks who pinged us I think Vishal Sandesh Pooja on the in the session so hello thank you for joining uh 
Pooja, if you want to know more about Scalar Academy, we can give a brief overview a bit later in the call. And we can definitely address your question after this, which is, you know, going to office or working from home. Uh, Sandesh Vishal, do let us know if there are any questions. So cool. The quick question here is obligation to think, obligation to dissent. Very specific, narrow question. Typically, if you want to put someone in the spot, learn from Bhavik, give them a very narrow question, then leave them hanging. Thanks, Bhavik. My, my what, what I would love to sort of give a view of is typically a meeting is a orchestration of people sharing their thoughts in the most basic way, right? It just, it's in sync, not in async, like on chat or Slack or email. And so what is important is that there is clarity on a common goal that one is solving for, which is what you laid out. So the leader will lay out for me or for 10 other people in that meeting that we're solving for sign off on a decision of whether to launch this product or not. And so for that, each participant may be representing a function. Maybe I am representing business. Somebody else is representing marketing. Somebody else is representing sales. Each function has a certain obligation to respond affirmatively or otherwise on that decision in the meeting. So my mental model is that the moment I enter a meeting as a participant, if, if the agenda or the definition of success on that meeting is not clear, I will clarify, like, what do you want to get out of this meeting? And whoever that may be, right? It may be uh, someone in our team. It may be a uh, product team. It may be tech team. It may be founder. It may be anyone to ask them what is it that they want because then you can help get to that objective that the meeting person has set. Uh, within that, my belief is that typically if there is a bias to speak or not speak or a bias to voice a differing opinion or not, my default is I will give my point of view even if it is not in agreement with the trending point of view, as long as I have some data, ideally also some logic and data both to back that point of view. And the reason I think that's important is because there are very few times in a sync conversation where people's wavelengths in a thought process are going together. And if you spot something that nobody else has, which is a blocker or a problem or a potential fault in the future, then for the benefit of everyone, including yourself, I think the obligation, the prerogative one has that I believe one should have is to say no, Let's think about this. It doesn't make sense. Maybe we need to plug this gap. So my definition, my, my answer is always, it's, it's a no or a doubt in my head unless proven otherwise. So I will strive to educate myself, absorb information, take active notes, try to interpret what you're saying in the meeting, make sure I'm convinced. And if I'm not, I will either ask you why and clarify, or if I'm convinced that I'm of a differing opinion, that I will come back and say, hey, I disagree for ABC. But I'd, like, no. I'd love to do it uh, live. And the key hack there is a lot of people, I think, absorb the information in the meeting, walk away half agreed, and then the other person doesn't know that they've half agreed. Three days later, they come back and say, oh, you know what? I don't fully understand this. I don't fully agree with this. Uh, now, that's bad meeting participation. I think as a participant, the obligation is you engage and either actively say that I'm agreed or I don't agree or I need time. I will come back and tell you within one day. The part that most people don't do as participants that I also did not do earlier is I would not make these three states clear. Now, I think the, the hack to get this done is at the end, say, if you're not clear, say, I need time, we'll come back. So the other person knows. Uh, a non-decision clarity is better than a, a, a non-agreement while a non-full agreement while a decision signed off that eventually changes again. again. So uh, that's a little bit of how I would like to participate in meetings. But uh, fun, fun. Before going further into this theory, I think Uja has the question. Uh, I think one of the folks who is very pleasantly called Chode Buddy also has a question around how work has may have increased uh, system design questions. So cool. We'll take Pooja's question first, which is, uh, it's too simple for you, Bhavik, but I'm going to complexify it a little bit. Do you miss going to office or is work from home suitable? And with that, I would like you, Bhavik, to talk a little bit about what is the primary difference that is the most annoying and the most delightful between office and home. Hmm. Yeah, I think I would anyway have to split it up into what do I love about it and what do I hate about it? Because honestly, my answer is it's a mixed bag. Uh, it was delightful till a point, and then it's become a mis mixed bag over time, right? So let me actually split it into that. What do I love about it? What do I hate about it? Hmm. What I love about it is the flexibility it offers me 
to control my schedule what am i doing where am i doing when am i doing it right if at the end of the day all you're solving for is outcomes i can very comfortably get up from my workstation hmm. go outside to the balcony listen to some music sip some chai take some time off for myself gather my thoughts come back i have control over my time similarly i have control of how and when i want to engage with people no one can walk into my room and suddenly distract me when i'm in deep flow or thinking really deeply about some problem statement mm. right back in office days people can take the liberty to do that sometimes it's productive mm. very often it's destructive usually it's entertaining mm. but that really destroys control right so work from home really solve that for me less distractions mm. more control over what i want to do when and where similarly mm. i don't like working at one place and working beyond a point in time nothing stops me from picking up my laptop going and lying down on the couch for half an hour and then coming back so that mm. flexibility is lovely the bad part to me is and that's for me as a person mm. i love being around people because energy is something i like to vibe off if you're in mm. a room and you're brainstorming with people problem solving with people uh in the middle everyone's tired some banter going on all of these things are things that energize me whether it's banter whether it's exchange of thoughts whether it's exchange of ideas that has something that's gone missing since a very long time mm. it's starting to poke me now i like sitting around people do your own thing i'll do my own thing but in that middle when you have a problem statement you quickly vibe on or you mm. have a common shared joke that part has now gone missing it's a bit hard to recreate in a digital setup so i think those are the Ch- ups and downs for me got it got it so th- there's almost a, a shared experience of work versus a solo experience of work yeah a solo is giving you more flexibility uh, but it also gives you a little bit of limitation on how much you can engage in vibe off of the energy of coworkers whether that's yeah, an idea yeah. or a joke or anything of that sort correct so there's a spectrum right there's complete isolation and there's mm-hmm. way too much intermingling i like a balance i want to choose when i'm doing my solo work i want to choose mm-hmm. when i want to engage with a group it's not as simple mm-hmm. but if you're able to solve for that even in a physical workspace rather than working from home mm-hmm. i think it leads to more delight in life um i am mm-hmm. not someone who likes to stay cooped up and work all the time i am also not someone who likes to be distracted very frequently so i think that's the balance for me uh what about you what do you miss about going to office right i mean i i don't i I'm, i'm trying to wonder if i really miss too much my answer is that i don't miss uh, a lot other than instant access to people who i might want to jam with or some problem solving with uh because i my my model is i prefer flow and my flow tend to uh, tends to come in when there's less distracting noise or uh, distracting someone coming in and saying hi when i'm in the middle of something so i i was usually i mean if you if you go back to you know when when i was in consulting at client side and mckinsey going to a client side i was completely in disarray because you're sitting on a table with five people so my engagement manager three associates one guy is eating another guy is taking some call you are here the ac stops working wifi suddenly has some issue and then you have to crank away and get to output within 12 hours because every day you have to deliver something useful and i would find that deeply jarring not because the work was extremely difficult it was but because the situation made it even more difficult so what i would do is i would actually end up going to the conference room i remember the client site which is not being used all the lights are off nobody knows anyone is in the conference room i have gone in with the lights off my laptop light is on i've spent 2 hours finishing my work then i go to the team room and then somebody will take some chat somebody will say something and they'll take a call i'll be like okay fine i don't have to do focused work so i prefer very clear option of going into dark mode which i think is about 60 to 80% off my work day for 20 to 40% i can engage but my engagement has to be by my consent not because somebody came up to me and said let's talk now for 30 minutes uh, yeah. but yeah like i think chote buddy also saying i do miss the free food and and fun time with with people particularly for example the tt table at, at our office in scala uh, but not 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 too much that i miss actually interesting i think what what's interesting is you're saying something similar of hey i like my flow time i don't mind disruption but my flow to disruption ratio is 80 20 i don't like the mm. 50 50 that often workspaces offer 
Correct, correct. Very I prefer con- I prefer the ability to choose dark mode. Not too many places allow mm. it. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Awesome. Let's let's move to the next question. There's one which I found in our community polling, which uh, I was very tempted to throw at you, and I'm going to exercise that temptation right now, because I honestly think you're someone who does this very well. Which is, everyone has a different way of communicating ideas verbally, right? Everyone has a different speaking style. And there are a lot of nuances to this. I know you have broken this down into a framework of how does one become better at communicating with voice? Hmm. So hmm. how does one get, her, get better at verbal communication? Is my question to you. Got it, got it, got it. But I think thumbs up to Chote Buddy and Pooja who have hopefully got some answers and opinions that may not be the best, but helpful. Cool. So how, do I, how does one communicate with voice? I think, uh, I think broadly, you know, speed it up maybe. Uh, two minute answer uh, to me there's essentially there's there's three parts in spoken communication one is the message architecture itself the second is the verbal communication verbal vehicle of that message and the third is the non verbal vehicle of that message now the mechanics of it are number 2 and number 3 but non verbal is by some research it tends to be more than 90%, almost 93% of what we communicate is non-verbal. For example, my eyebrows are frowning at you now. That's, that's non-verbal vehicle of communicating message architecture of complete and utter disappointment that this is what we are doing on Friday night. Uh, but there is also verbal vehicles where one can play with variables that are very obvious to the listener, but not often known to us consciously. Uh, and, and those are, you know, any theater artist, any person who's a professional speaker or a vocalist would be able to say it. But at a high level, those are pitch, tone, pace, clarity, attitude. And the ability to change pitch, which obviously varies between male and females, the ability to go different, different in tone, uh, the ability to play with pace, go really, really fast or slow it down so that someone can absorb clarity of you know words being interpreted and heard the exact way that you want them to be heard. Uh, and then amplitude, of course, right? you can go super loud, which I don't know if this mic will allow or you can go really soft. Uh, All of those are important. Now, let me take an example of how this uh, verbal vehicle, the non-verbal vehicle is a frown, for example, a verbal vehicle uh, works. I remember very specifically, there's this one leader that I used to work with in in my consulting life who used a very counterintuitive method of grabbing attention in a 10, 12 person boardroom meeting. Instead of trying to be the loudest or the most vociferous in the room, this person would lean in Uh, and effectively be the softest such that everybody would be forced to shut up and just zoom into their like chairs and be like, what is this guy saying? It sounds like it's important. I can't understand it. Let me pay attention. And it was incredible. It's like a noisy room goes silent because one guy is speaking so softly and so persistently that people are feeling FOMO and they want to hear him. And so they've shut up. That hardly happens in an Indian meeting. So it was a unique way of using verbal vehicles consciously in terms of amplitude and pace to ensure the message lands well. So verbal is that, non-verbal is of course, gesticulation, expression, etc. The message architecture, various ways of thinking about it. My top down way that I look at it is, I usually go back to have an equation in my mind, uh, which is ultimately I'm solving for the message that I want the person to interpret. And then backwards, I will solve for the message that I want to deliver. And then backwards, I'll solve for the message that I'm intending. But I'm almost solving for what is this person gonna walk away with? in terms of the thought and in terms of the feeling. Uh, in fact, sometimes I go a little bit further and say, thought is the cognitive element of it. Feeling is the emotional element of it. And sensation is the physical element of it. For example, sometimes people feel like this energized, you know, I am running towards my target kind of thing. So you want to have somebody with a message, have the right sensation, the right feeling, the right uh, cognition on it. And then you work backwards from it, craft it. I usually have five bullet points. But after that, I riff with the room. Uh, and I believe that if you're practicing your verbal and nonverbal vehicles, point two and point three, well enough, you can almost play an orchestra of you know which tool when amplitude when pace when pitch when tone when, and of course a frown, which I will use again and again with you. So those are some ways in which one can improve spoken communication to have impact, and and that impact then translates into both how you're perceived and business needles that move. Interesting. So you're saying, I mean, I'm going to dumb it down for myself. You're saying. Firstly, there is architecture, which is what am I saying? Then there is verbal vehicle, which is how am I saying it? 
And then there is non-verbal vehicle, which is what am I doing while saying it? You're saying hmm. if you land those three things, what am I saying? How am I saying it? What am I doing while saying it? You can change the dynamic with anyone you're talking to. They will be able to understand you better. They will be able to walk away with what you want them to walk away with. And if you fix those three things, then it's golden. And the way to fix those three things you're saying is, what am I saying is something you need to plan or have a running answer for. And define this is what constitutes success. What are the two, three ways I can ensure that? How am I saying it is pitch, tone, pace, pronunciation, Mm. loudness, or softness. Mm. Mm. And then what am I doing while saying it could be hand movements, frown, you know, sitting down, standing up, all of that. But that's your Mm. hack. How do you do all this simultaneously? Simultaneously. I I think the way to approach a communication, you know, point, whether that is one-on-one, two-on-one, many-on-one, one-on-many, whatever permutation combination, my approach is that this is not a conversation. Most of the time, uh, when it's just one-on-one with small team with you, it's you know, it's just communication. But otherwise, my approach is that this is me on stage, and I go back to start thinking of hey, when I used to debate or when I used to act in in college or in school, how would I use the entire facet of abilities of verbal, nonverbal, and cognition to land the message. And it's almost it almost becomes this multi-modal. Find all the tools you can to get the point across. It's a performance. Uh, so it's the mindset of you know, being on stage, uh, as opposed to the mindset of hey, I'm chatting with you. Uh, and Got you it. have to switch between the two, but it's situational. It's a performance, and to deliver a good performance, you need preparation, and then you need to start having fun. I guess is is a broader point, and you enjoy doing it. I suppose. Yeah. Got yeah, it. yeah. No, Actually, great, so, great source of joy. CH Code Buddy actually had a had an interesting point where he said, he or she said, uh, I find it difficult to explain sometimes because I want to use a whiteboard, but now we are so verbal communication oriented. I think there are mm. two parts to that which I found interesting. One is, yes, earlier we used to have physical stuff we can use. Now mm. it's just our face, our voice, and some chat on the side, which is an obvious challenge, and you need to up mm. the game for communication. Uh, mm. The other thing which this prompted for me, and I don't know if CH Code Buddy had this in mind or not, but I go back to my early days and I faced mm. this initially where there were times people would come and ask me for an explanation and I would mm. fumble it, right? Which to me was a lack of preparation. And this I've observed in a lot of people early in their career, right? It's just there are key moments when you have maybe some face time with your manager or your boss and out of the mm. blue there's a question thrown at you and you fumble it. So what are your thoughts about fixing that? You have 10 minutes, 15 minutes with your boss, with your manager, and they've asked you for your views or an answer or an update. How do you make the most of that? Otherwise, in especially in this digital era, a fumble goes bad. You can't really go to their room five minutes later and fix it. You're stuck. You'll have to set up another meeting. Mm. You'll have to send them a long Slack message. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great question. It's essentially, the question, if I got it correctly, is, yeah, how do you effectively communicate without fumbling in response to CH code and a few other messages on chat? With, and with the nuance of, let's, let's make it even more interesting. What are the most common fumbles which are horrible? It's when you're talking to your boss, right? So how do I quickly answer my boss out of the blue? What, what do you need to quickly answer your boss out of the blue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say the method that I have found, and I have fumbled a lot, a lot of times in, in the first few years, even now I often do. Uh, the method that I tend to find useful is by default. I think that communication is just the delivery. As long as the thought is organized in my mind, I can zoom out at any point in that thought. It'll take me 30 seconds and then give the zoomed out version of that thought to the person. Typically, if a superior, a manager, a boss, uh, a founder is asking something uh, that, hey, how is this campaign going on? (laughs) You know, lead gen or growth or anything of that sort. Uh, or product metrics. I don't want to tell them that this button has changed. Hua, yaha pe this one thing has happened. You know, the emailers have gone out. No, 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 no. I broadly already have the thought architecture in my mind that while, while I'm working on this, not for the purpose of communication, while I'm working on this, I know that there is an overall campaign design. There is the entire messaging. There are flow metrics, and there are interdependencies and transfer of you know the leads to a certain system. And I will step back for 30 seconds, not say anything. If I'm working on the email, I will step back from the emailer 
to the mid funnel engagement to the entire reason why mid funnel is important to the campaign objective and then those 30 seconds allow me to zoom out and then when i start communicating i've used up 30 seconds out of 5 minutes but the four and a half four and a half minutes that i'll use with the superior they will start from the top saying the objective is this we have done this on the product on the flow on the messaging currently emailer campaigns are going on this is an interesting insight you should know by the way this is working well here is something that's not working well and what i need from cross whatsapp email and and maybe website pop ups and if you have any other ideas that i have not seen because for me the my always be there to do work well anyway communication is just mm-hmm. one part of it and if somebody is interrupting me to ask me some the zoom out view which will enable me to test my own thinking when i articulate it plus it allows me from which i can gain value so for me it's an opportunity to get more and that mm-hmm. that, that switch was fundamental in making me feel me i should think of it as somebody's asking me to update them on what i'm doing now i think of it as yeah they're asking for an update which gives me an opportunity to ask them for help something that might help me deliver better uh so there's two Got broad it. things there's a thought architecture take a moment deliver it uh, and then take it in the spirit of not giving an update because somebody is asking but in the spirit of taking it as an opportunity to get more input and help hmm you use that with say your bosses or your managers whatever as an opportunity hmm. uh have a running answer always not because they're going to ask you but it helps you organize your thoughts yeah yeah and then don't value add to it hey what can you tell me in return that will add value to me and then your bosses start seeing you differently they see you as someone who's prepared who's on top of things in control hmm. and who's intelligent very when they'll say you know tell me something i think that's very powerful very interesting yeah and and i think i'm going to pick uh, you know darshan has said that things are buffering so commentary on the technology that we're using streamyard please do better if you're watching the admin you need to make this tool better but i, I think there's a question uh, from nitin which is what are the best communication hacks which can be used while negotiating something uh, more spicy i guess mm-hmm. the question is uh, how uh, you know a conversation where you have to negotiate something that is high stakes it could be mm-hmm. salary it could be, uh, your kpi or kr for this quarter how do you hmm. approach a sensitive high stakes conversation where negotiation is important to get what you want interesting question uh, some negotiations still date uh, cause some butterflies in the tummy but i think uh, let me let me share some of my hacky thoughts around this i think before you step into a negotiation as with everything else in life you need to be prepared but what do you need to be prepared with right uh, the goal of a negotiation is they come with their requirements you come with your requirements you it's a meeting the first topic mm-hmm. we started with in this call in this video right it's a meeting mm-hmm. the meeting has some success what is success from a negotiation it is you get what you want they get what they want ideally and you land up mm-hmm. on a common answer no more confusion mm-hmm. a negotiation by deep now mm-hmm. you need to figure out what is given what is take right negotiation put yourself in their shoes understand what do they want and why do they want make a list of things mm. that they want take your guess on what are their must haves what are their good to haves what can they maybe flex with that they give for you but the rest they will take from you then go back into your shoes nice comfy and figure out what do i want out of this make a list okay i want x y z x is must have y is good to have z i can use mm. as a bargaining tool that's fine mm. so that's your preparation going into meeting second thing mm. before you go into meeting uh pump yourself up don't don't be flaky right be very clear mm. on this is what i want and i'm going mm. to stand my ground in a very reasonable manner mm. it, it might make you nervous it might make you anxious but that's very important otherwise you might do all this preparation go you will hear one counterpoint and like oh no this is an awkward moment i don't want to go through this it's a confrontation let me walk away so don't do that mm. calm down get yourself pumped up go into the meeting with a mindset that's a conversation amongst equals it's not mm. it's not you being inferior them being superior it's not you demanding things mm. that you don't deserve if you fundamentally mm. think that then please take a step back and figure out why am i going to this con- into this negotiation you can't go into mm. a negotiation feeling that you are inferior that's a battle lost already right so mm. take a step back understand what they want understand what you want figure out what are the gives mm. and takes calm yourself down understand why you're going into that 
when mm. you enter the meeting you have these two lists assuming mm. you are you you are prepared well you know what to give what to take figure out what is a common ground if at mm. the end of the negotiation you feel like it's still not getting where you want it to get to be shameless about saying hey i don't think this is landing where i would like maybe let's set up more time let me think through this and figure out if mm. there's a way we both can flex go back with a solution to them next time mm. start with a solution that hey i think this is a middle ground because you are getting xyz i'm getting xyz what do you think so that's that's my mental model i'm making it sound way easier than it is even my stomach churns to today with some of these conversations but that i think mm. these are the bare minimum you have to do if you don't understand their psyche and your psyche if you don't understand their must has and your must has you're never going to be smart in a negotiation tell mm. us your hacks mm. yash tell us your hacks you know i i agree with you i think a part a big part of it is broadly those two or three elements right one is the preparation and an awareness of other versus self negotiables non negotiables just the preparation element of it then there is the hold the calm reasonable approach element of it then there is the find an exit clause if things are not going your way <laughs> aspect of it so i i don't suppose that i uh, have done too many negotiations where it's been very very uh, open ended usually there is always a pre decided element but what i found is uh, there are certain hacks that are a little bit more i would say uh, you know there are a little bit more first principles in how people think and behave it's beyond the preparation so for example there's a couple one is called a, you know a door in the face approach another is called a foot in the door approach now what does that mean door in the face is hey bhavik uh, should we go to bali tomorrow for a nice vacation with you know five other friends and spend a week it'll be truly fantastic you're going to be like no man what is this nonsense are you mad it's cold but then i'm like okay fine 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 let's rent a car go to kunnur you'll be like okay maybe so if i directly asked you about kunnur you would have been like no man it's covid what are you saying but because you already exhausted your ability to say no your natural reluctance is yaar wapas no nahi bolna let me just leave it a little bit soft so you you exhaust somebody's desire to say no by giving them an absolutely obviously unreasonable request and they'll slam the door in your face when you knock on that door again most likely they're going to be like fine maybe i'll consider it so door in the face is a classic classic right it's used all over the world it's time immemorial from the art yeah. of war to psychology 101 another one is foot in the door foot in the door is when you basically you know you're not going to get too much you want to go to america or something with your family and you know people should all plan the ticket and lots of money has to be spent uh and you know it's not going to happen so there the approach is you just seed the idea a little bit again and again it's an ongoing negotiation saying oh look at this nba is so nice Oh, by the way, why don't we do this? And so you nudge a little bit of a foot in the door, where you mm. give some examples that prevent the door from being shut. You leave the possibility of the America trip open, and then you find a fertile point to hit the home run. So there are different ways that you can orchestrate beyond just the reparation, beyond being calm, beyond ending it with optionality, which is you play on basic heuristics and mental models of people. Uh, hmm. one of them being of course door in the face because people don't like saying no too many times nobody likes saying no nobody likes it is the fundamental reason why b2c sales works because you can only say no so many times and you know nobody nobody wants to close a possibility if you've kept it open kept it open it may grow in their mind it's also inception to some extent but foot in the door is much more basic than that so i'm saying there's a there's the dark arts that can be used and there is of course the basic <laughs> uh, preparation yeah. 101 vanilla i think this is a really interesting approach. This is that interesting bit between preparation and the actual meeting, where yeah. either you seed the idea, yeah, or you set up well so that you get what you want, which also now Correct. makes me wary of responding to requests from you because now I'm going to always watch out. Hey, he's asking me something which is very idiotic. Aha! I know something more reasonable is going to follow. I know what Yash is doing. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, the effectiveness of the approach is is the lack of the other person being able to fully see it. I would say it's. Mm-hmm. my model is that i try not to use any of this but it is a last resort mechanism where there is no hope and there is no reason the person can't understand do a door in the face do a foot in the door do one of these these are these are dark arts on the side in an ideal world one shouldn't have to do this if your relationship is strong enough so i'm sure you will go bali uh, <laughs> because anyway you're excited kunur kunur it is kunur so yogesh has a question which i think is quite fantastic 
Uh, Nitin, hopefully that answers a little bit of what you had in your mind. Please let us know. Yogesh's question is, how do you remove inferiority complex issues along with, uh, you know, imposter syndrome? This is perhaps the most common early career feeling ever. <laughs> across sector, across industry, across college, you may be the topper of your college. And trust me, I know. You will still feel it if you know if you're if you're in a situation where you enter. So this is common. What what have you done, Bhavik, to try to cope with it? Uh, have you found hacks that you or friends or others have have worked with so that this imposter syndrome is uh, is not a uh, inhibiting factor? Wow, that's a that's a heavy one, man, and it's a it's one I can relate to honestly. Yogesh, you're not the only one. Everyone faces this. No one realizes everyone else is facing this. Uh, I've faced this. Even till date, I continue to do it at times. There is always in the moments of weakness when you're you're feeling like, hmm, am I the imposter in this room? Is everyone else smarter and I'm the stupidest person? And I'm going to be very honest with you. I haven't cracked this one completely. I think there are mm. a few hacks. There are a few systemic long-term things one can do. But mm. this is a very, very heavy subject. Uh, it, it's one that goes right to psychology. It's one where therapists make their money. Bread and butter mm -hmm. of therapists is by solving this amongst all young adults in India and abroad. Mm. Uh, and India especially so for, for various reasons. I mean, look, in the short term, there are some hacky ways. One is acknowledge why you're feeling that. A lot of times it's mm. uh, under preparation. So try to solve that. A lot of times it is glorifying the person opposite you where they mm. seem perfect. And we don't put ourselves in their shoes enough or we don't know them intimately enough to understand that, hey, they are human too. They have their struggles. Mm. They have their problems. We, we always assume the other person is glorious and we are the biggest idiots. So trying mm. to take a step back and unpack the other person's life. What does their day look like? What does their week look like? Change the conversation to from their perfect and I'm better than me. There are some things I may mm. be doing better than them. Let me learn. Let me not glorify them. Right. That's, that's mm. step number two. One very hacky way, which a lot of people say uh, mm. they follow, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but it still works at times is faking it till you make it. But fake it till you make it is a very common exercise. You keep putting mm. yourself in that spot and feeling like you belong. These are all hacks, I think. I think to be honest, a lot of impost from our childhood, how we grew up, how we saw ourselves, how we think the world sees us. Uh, every day more about them than they actually do. Everyone thinks that the mm. other person is thinking about how I am behaving or looking right now. Whereas the other person is mm. actually not thinking about you. You are not the center of the world. They are the center of the world. They are thinking the same thing about themselves. So a lot of imposter syndrome comes from childhood, comes from how we've grown up. And honestly, the system, a lot of introspection, being honest with yourself and unconditional help. You go talk to a therapist. Mm. Hey, this is what happened in your childhood. And this is what's mm. affecting you to date, right? And you have so many aha moments. So you identify, hey, this happened to you since then. You behave like this, and you're like, you have to change that, right? So there are a few hacks. I personally believe you need a systemic solution. And luckily, it's a way more affordable, 50 rupees, 500 rupees, than it used to be earlier. It is way more accessible. It's no longer about me having to go to Juhu and figure out a, a clinic where I can sit down and be comfortable with someone. Now it's virtual. You can talk to etc. Uh, so affordable willingness to go and treat it like any normal. That's my view on it. I know it's. I think Yash, you're closer to this because you've studied psychology. What's your view on this hmm. one? Yeah, the, I mean, the, is that uh, this is a more expert opinion, uh, like Bhavik said, but the layman answer, because I'm not already studied it as, a, as a, one of the electives in my undergrad, uh, and again, a theoretical psychology answer, this is my preference that I have found useful, uh, is broadly, the thesis of imposter is what? Is to say that I am here probably undeserving and may not, maybe I don't deserve to be here or in this room or in this situation or in this setting. So it is by default, there is an implicit bar of judgment on this is what is required to be here versus this is where I am. So there are two lines that are drawn in your mind. Feelings come after that. Inferiority, unhappiness, anxiety. But there are two lines, line of what is needed and line of where I am. Most of the time, both lines are a function of absolutely uh, misidentified and garbage hand-me-down perceptions. They are not original thoughts built bottom-up. They are inherited ways of thinking and perceiving the world. Uh, by inherited, I mean 
बिकॉज पीपल आर फ्रॉम अ सर्टन स्टैंडर्ड टू बी इन लेट्स से कंसल्टिंग मेकिंग द एनवायरमेंट हियर एंड आई डोंट फील लाइक आई एम बीइंग एबल टू मैच दैट काइंड ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन मे बी आई एम नॉट गुड एनफ सो देयर इज अ बार दैट यू परसीव एंड देयर इज अ सेल्फ बार एंड देन यू सी द डिफरेंस एंड देन आई फील लाइक ओ माय गॉड आई एम इंपोस्ट आई शुड बी हियर सो माय मॉडल इज वेरी सिंपल you know therapy and all that is is great i think i would highly recommend it but uh, there is a mode of unpacking why that bar is why is that line here supposed to be why am i seeing myself here and then most importantly accepting that there is no such thing as uh, you know uh, necessary a, a standard for everything uh, which which is an important switch i had to make from being a, a student to a professional because you are by definition in the indian system i think it's a mistake of our system is you are by definition as a student questions uh, for way too many pointless things why do you need a unit test every two weeks what is this nonsense it's complete garbage uh, evaluated evaluation evaluated evaluation this evaluation flows into personal life and then professional life as well it's and possible if you're lucky or if you're getting help you can get to do that and and that that solves most of the root issue to me so remove mm-hmm. evaluation improvement go to it and then run with it so broadly that requires more expert opinion so we may not be qualified uh, yeah yeah hopefully yogesh that gives you some weird question a couple of times now rephrasing it so we'll take the latest phrasing for you bhavik uh, it's mm-hmm. interesting you're getting these questions now i think it's also a little bit of work from home stress how do you cope with judgmental environments uh, and how do you respond to it while being cautious always and this mm-hmm. is again something mm-hmm. that you know it can happen at home it can happen at work it can happen in college it can happen in hostel uh, a judgmental environment exist you can't change it it's our system mm-hmm. to a large extent so the question is how do you respond and cope to, cope with it hmm got it got it understood or see this is a bit of a situation to situation answer right because judgmental environments can vary in types there is a situation where there's a power dynamic you feel like your manager or your boss or superiors at work are the ones creating that judgmental environment every move of yours is being analyzed evaluated uh, every time you say something the other person is forming a judgment which will flow into some outcomes for you that's one type of judgmental where there's a power dynamic in place in type of judgmental and there might be many more i'm telling you two which i have seen or experienced the second type of judgmental is a bit of what we spoke about earlier right which is where you feel like your peers are constantly mm. evaluating you and you start perceiving mm. yourself as being tested am i as good as them am i worthy of conversations there that's another type of judgment right so there there's lateral and there's top down mm. right, from your superiors um i think each of those are handled a bit differently uh, and i think what spandana you're asking is how do you manage to thrive in such a situation how how much do you share how do you figure that out Hmm. Uh, that, that's what at least i am taking away from the question if i am wrong do do my answer uh, i'll try to take a crack at the first one which is hey if if i am in an environment where my managers uh, engage with me in a setup where i feel like i'm constantly being evaluated how do i deal with it because most probably i'm going to start feeling anxious i'm going to start feeling nervous and the more anxious and the more nervous i feel i'm going to fumble uh i'm mm. i'm not going to be able to show them my true potential so that that's the problem mm. statement i'm going to try to answer now uh spandan again add in the comment if that's a different question to what you are asking i can redo my thinking but on this one where it's a top down where you feel like uh you know people are mm. always judging you top down and you want to put your best foot forward but you feel under pressure uh i'm going to start sounding like a repeat repetitive record but whenever i used to feel that i realized 60 80% of the times it was because i did not believe i was prepared sufficiently to have that conversation and that was 60 to 80% of the time that has a separate fix i'll come to the remaining 20 to 40 number but for that 60 to 80% of the time what i realized was i had to switch to always having a running answer to always being on top of things and especially when you're younger in your career when you're an individual contributor and in i see you tend to go deep 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 into your problem statement into the data you're looking at into the code you're writing into the presentation you're making and that's a job you're an individual contributor you're going to do a lot of tactical things what individual contributors frequently miss out on is taking a step back periodically and honestly it's not always their fault right as individual contributors we have tough deadlines we have a lot of work to complete so you will crank out output 
what you will have to solve for over time is as you get better, as you get more productive, whatever time you save, make sure you're taking a step back. It's okay if your answer instead of 100% is 80%, but use that 20% of the time to step back and understand what am I doing? What is it solving for? How does it fit into the worldview of my manager? Because you are working at zero feet. They are operating at 100 feet. Whenever you engage with them, you can't engage with them at zero feet. They will start getting annoyed because they're not getting the answer they want to get. Right? And that's when they create that environment where you, you know, they are doing, this is not right. What are you saying? This doesn't make sense. I didn't ask you that, blah, blah, blah. And then you start perceiving that as, hey, they're judging me poorly. They're constantly judging me. So first is mm. change that exchange of information. Mm. Take a step back, understand your work from their perspective so that when they engage with you, you give them an answer that they understand at 100 feet. And then you go down to zero feet wherever required. You will start noticing that their reaction to your answer starts changing. Instead of, this is not right, it goes into, hmm, that makes sense, and they're engaging with you more. Uh, that is my personal experience where you will start suddenly realizing that, hey, the environment wasn't as judgmental. It was just a wavelength mismatch. And I perceived them as always being unhappy with me. I have now fixed it because I'm starting with the answer they want to hear or the shape in which they want to hear it. And then I'm giving them whatever my message is. And to do that, you need to take out time. So that's very tactically speaking from my personal experience. Again, might not hold for you. My personal experience, a lot of time environments that I perceived to be judgmental were just a wavelength mismatch. That, that's 60% mm. of the time what, what used to happen to me. 40% right? of the time, maybe it's genuinely judgmental and they're treating you in a certain way. Uh, you don't like the way they're talking to you or the tone in which they're talking to you or mm. the type of questions they're throwing at you. You don't feel they're justified, right? There's only so much you can prepare in advance. Uh, honestly, after a point, you have to have a very frank conversation with them where you tell them, look, your objective is X, Y, Z. My objective is ABC. This is how you can make me successful. Part of that is I respond to certain ways of talking and communicating better. Please let's set up a cadence between us, a style of communication between us. Because when you ask me questions in this manner, it throws me off. It's making me inefficient in communicating with you. I also lose, you also lose. It's a lose-lose. Let's make it a win-win. What people don't realize, especially again as individual contributors, is it is all right to have that conversation with your boss and tell them, boss, this is how you can make me successful. And me successful is you successful. So it is okay to go and demand from them a tweak in their style. You don't have to accept their style of communication. You can, you can demand that, hey, this is not working for me. It's making me unproductive. Please change your style of communicating. It will solve for your problem. It will solve for my problem. I've, I've rarely seen people do that, especially in Indian workspaces, right? We feel obligated to adapt whatever is our ma manager style. We don't give mm -hmm. them feedback and demand a change in style, which we think can solve for outcome. So for me personally, those were the 60, 40 places where I thought it was judgmental, but I realized that I need to put myself in their shoes and solve for their answer, their tone and mannerism and behavior with me changes. 40% was where it was genuinely unproductive, judgmental, tone was not right. You have to go have a frank conversation. Otherwise, you'll be in that frying pan for the next two years and there'll be no way out of it. So that's mm -hmm. my very personal experience. Josh, what judgmental environments have you encountered? How have you tackled them? No, I, I fully agree with your approach, uh, which is you, you've got to... I mean, Spandana, great question, first of all. I think... Beautiful question. Broadly, broadly, the, the, the thing that takes a while for, for, for most... For me... Uh, to understand it took me a while to understand and it takes i think a lot of early career folks just like me some while to understand is that the manager's job is to make you successful and it's almost like if you're able to lay out for the manager that this is how i respond well you know ask me questions at this time let me be for a couple of hours don't ask me every 30 minutes because then i'm not able to focus i, I promise you the output will come this is the best way to make bring out output out of me uh, that user, how to how to work with me, user manual. That is the is the way that I think works. To be honest, it doesn't always, because often there are environments that you can't change. So there's only so much you can do. I would say the algorithm is hey, either minimize exposure to that environment to the extent possible. That could mean taking more walks, uh, you know, getting more air, taking more chai breaks, uh, finding another manager. Uh, changing your company if it's cons consistently making you feel that way. Uh, and it, while, of course, changing the environment is not always possible while you're in that, 
try to make it a win win like bhavik said with a uh, the user manual of hey here's what you need to do to make me work well uh, because implicitly you should know whoever your manager is whatever your function in your manager's job is to make you successful and if you forget that then there is a challenge so if you don't forget that you'll probably use it but i think we're at the end bhavik uh, we should wrap up uh, maybe one last question for you which has come up mm-hmm. from thank you so much spandana for your question uh, which has come up from uh, so yogesh has another question and maybe that's the last question which is again an existential one so good way to end friday should anyone be following <laughs> social norms in terms of communicating or being yourself uh, oh by the way nitin has a question nitin is asking if scalar will launch a psychology program for engineers nitin there is possible if you find a few hundred <laughs> engineers who are excited to learn psych 101 i'm sure we can cobble something up together i have personally found that a lot of engineers would love to understand more about mindsets behavior user nudges because the tools engineers build are used by humans at the end of the day today maybe 10 years later some ai will use them uh, and so today it's important to understand behavior and all of that so would would love to you know organize something like that the only constraint is nothing we have a lot of topics lined up that people have already asked so if you have anywhere around you know 50 to 100 people that are excited about the session you know drop me a line on linkedin uh, we can figure something out but back to you bhavik last question of the evening mm-hmm. uh, and for everyone else if you have a final question you'd like to ask please let us know we can do that uh, otherwise this is the last question so should anyone be following societal norms uh, or uh, be yourself where people be jealous and prevent opportunity so it's essentially a question of how authentic should you be in the way you are and in the way you communicate without damaging yourself hmm hmm you guys i hope that's the sentiment of your question interesting interesting this is a question which will have very different answers from very different personalities i can again share my personal view on it but that's just how i perceive communication let me split it up into two parts right and again this might be this might resonate with some people might be problematic to some people i'm open to hearing counterpoints to this in the comments but my view is i usually differentiate my spaces uh there is my professional space there's my personal space uh for me in my professional space communication more often than not 60 70% of the time tends to be a tool for me to get my job done i have something i'm solving for the way i communicate mm. is solving for me to get my job done for my organization to get the job done and hence if there are 100 people i'm interacting with daily i tweak my communication style to each one of them so that when i'm talking to them they are vibing with me i am vibing with them we are understanding each other and we are getting the job done so in my professional space i personally see communication as a tool where if mm-hmm. i believe that what i am doing daily is something worth my time and it is an objective i really want to achieve then a mm-hmm. key part of that is getting people on board with me having this sh- same shared understanding and getting the job done mm-hmm. in my personal space with my friends with my family etc i think communication starts becoming not just a tool but often also a way of expressing my identity mm. there i can play around with it a bit more because while it is solving even now for some outcomes i might want to get something from my friend i might want to make my mom feel a certain way uh, so it is still solving for an outcome there i can start being more artistic more creative uh, what helps there is we also choose who we surround ourselves with right i choose my friends at all i choose my family circle i choose who i am interfacing with and with what objective if for example yash and i are hanging out on a saturday night uh, we have the objective of maybe having some fun through some content through some poetry through a debate through some intellectual uh, back and forth uh, mm-hmm. their communication style is a way of expressing myself in my professional space my communication style is to solve for a particular objective uh, and that's how i personally like to separate it i know a lot of people who believe that communication for them is so internal that they want to express themselves everywhere and that's personal choice for me i think it doesn't fit into my mental model as much of course if a workspace demands a complete shift in communication style which i am uncomfortable with i know it's not going to help me deliver outcome and that's not the right space for me so obviously it needs to allow me to play my professional space needs to allow me to play but my point of playing is to getting the job done and whatever helps me vibe with people so that's that's how i split it right this personal space professional space professional space i'm solving for outcomes i'm solving for great relationships 
So I will tweak my communication to my audience. In my personal space, I will choose who I engage with, how I engage with, and it can be getting the job done. It can be my artistic expression. So that's that's essentially how I see it. Yash, you're done. Now you've drawn the issue tree. If only we were doing this session on an iPad, we could have actually. And by the way, we'd love to. On the comments, you can tell us we can make these live sessions actually very problem solving oriented. We we generally do problem solving with DS algo for business, which is hey, let's break the problem down. Let's identify the variables. If you notice Bhavik's the way he communicated was actually a tree structure. Uh, so if you want some of that, we can modify the style and do some of that. We don't know if you want it, so we've not done it yet. Uh, Short answer, Yogesh. I think the logic. I fully agree with Bhavik. The feeling that I would like to leave you with, uh, in the spirit of the World Test Championship between India and New Zealand, is that whether you're a Rishabh Pant or a Sehwag or anyone else, right? There is no one size fits all answer in how you express yourself. It's mathematically there's something called the No Free Lunch Theorem, uh, where you can't take one solution of of Hey, I am always going to be super energetic and uh you know very very loud in all situations you have a style your style may not need to you don't need to become rahul dravid if you're a shapant but rishapant also needs a defense and an attack he can't be attacked all the time so within your authentic style you should have a range it's not a binary of hey do i be my authentic self or do i adapt to the situation be someone else no 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 no, no. that's stupid you have to be your authentic self and develop a range of authentic selves as per situations and that is how you know you can be your own self within within norms because i mean i i can be authentic go down on the road now and dance but the point is that at the end of the day uh, if i maintain certain broad parameters of my own authenticity it allows me to get more done at work and in life so it's not a binary it's a situational play with a range of authenticity a defense from rishabh pant very different from a defense from rahul dravid but both are defending because the situation demands it if the situation demands it do it lovely cricket analogy this, this yeah, is actually I'm just <laughs> very relevant to this time topical topical answer uh, essentially what you're saying is look <laughs> be yourself but don't be rigid about it if your self is 100 give yourself a band to operate 80 to 120 And use different styles for different people. So if you're Rishabh Pant, have a defense, have an offense. You're still Rishabh Pant. You're not behaving like that. Have a defense, have an offense. So understand what you're good at. There, everyone has a style they're good at. But then be flexible enough to play around with it. I think is is what you're saying, right, Yash? Correct, correct. For example, if you notice, uh, Yogesh, in this answer, Bhavik Sir was he drew the issue tree in his mind, the data structure, put the answer person professional. He broke it up again. And then he gave you that, and then he zoomed out, zoomed in, and then gave you example, and then zoomed it again, and paused and passed it back to me. I said, "Great, issue tree is made. I will take a metaphor first approach. What topic comes to mind? Cricket. It's relevant. Let me take a metaphor that might vibe with you." So there was a a conscious style where my natural instinct may have been I wanted to make that issue tree, but I said, "Is that the best answer we can give you? No. Issue tree is already drawn. Let me give the metaphor and analogy. So you have the imagery and you have the logic to think through this. So adapting to the situation." while i would like to do that i chose a different path similarly you should but no i think you know i'm glad that you like the session stefan uh, clearly we know you so you're going to be nice to us and say that you love it when i'm sure you <laughs> don't uh marina i think has a great point that if you're fighting against natural reactions it's obviously not the greatest space to be in 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 a workspace and you got to set boundaries i i do know we'll be we end havik but i think one question is there from anshul which mm-hmm. does merit a, a key point so It's a personal question, but I do think we're in that time where we're being very authentic in this convo to the extent possible. So, I guess the question is, why do I feel like slaves in a team sometimes do whatever is told, leave the activities? Is that is that normal? And this is a perhaps a sentiment that you know few people have the courage to admit, but I suspect a lot of us at work have felt at one point or the other. So, the feeling here is. why do i feel like one cog in the wheel being told to do something is that normal uh, in in a workplace do you think that's normal bhavik and maybe it no, is maybe it is you've, you've, you've been smartly making me the first responder and then you nicely comes <laughs> in you are going first this time yes is this normal <laughs> well 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 i bought 3 seconds with those three wells it's not going <laughs> to help me still uh my default is that uh, again this is slightly controversial but my my default is 
that most times there are workplaces that are essentially of, of, of two kinds. One, that think of the output of the work, the product or the profit or the revenue as the only goal with no other goal. That's the 20th century workplace that is not built on making the most out of their people. So it's just output. Everyone else can do their part in it. It doesn't matter. The other workplace is where output is one goal, but non-output is also a key component of the goal of the workplace because they see a symbiotic relationship between the non-immediately output kind of aspects, such as you know, not the product shipped, not the revenue, but also the happiness alignment of the people. So I fundamentally believe that they're both of these. My honest opinion is a large percentage of workspaces are even today uh, more the former, right? They'll just care about the output, which is revenue, I output, I etc. Baki gaya, okay, doesn't matter. Uh, but there is, if that number was 90, 95%, 98%, much, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it's probably moving towards a more holistic workplace. And the mental model uh, that one must have for this is the following. But before I answer with the mental model, answer the question is, is that normal? No, it's not. Uh, it, it's not normal in terms of, hey, should is this how work should be? But if you ask me, is this common? I would say perhaps yes. So it's common, but it's not normal. And so over time, as workplaces become better, it will become less common and less perceived as normal. But yes, it is prevalent now of, of, of the limited world that I have seen. Uh, the way to ensure, as if you're a manager or if you're even a manager, one way to ensure that things don't go in this fashion where there is just a feeling of, I'll do what you tell me to do, is that you have to solve for the team a cycle. And that cycle has to have three components. There has to be a constant loop of alignment, execution, and renewal. What bad workplaces do is they just align. Ki ye target hai. Jao, itna bech ke right? And then there will be execution where there isn't much support. You go execute to figure it out. And then again, they'll get a new target aligned and new execution, new target and new execution. Good workplaces, however, pause between the alignment and the execution, like an F1 car race, take a pit stop, do a renewal. A renewal is like a refueling of your energy. It could be a skill upgrade. It could be an office retreat. It could be a dinner with your team. It could be a motivation session with your manager. This is where you renew, you regroup yourself. And then you align again for the next quarter and then you execute. So you will always in a fast growth private sector environment, you will always execute to deliver on goals. Almost, you know, majority of people that I've worked with in my life have seen, forget that the renewal needs to happen. The best managers and the best employees solve for that renewal. And, and so when you look back and think of, hey, this manager I absolutely love working with, you will 90%, I'm sure, be able to go back and say, this person had a rhythm. And that rhythm included renewal aspects, but they would align, execute, renew, align, execute, renew. So that cycle is important. Does answer your question, Anshul? That's the cycle to have. You can educate your manager on it as well. Uh, it's it's common. It's not what normal should be. And hopefully it won't be later. But I do admit that I have seen it a plenty. Uh, so Bhavik, now that you know, you've got extra time to think and smile and nod at me, uh, you know, the ball is in your court. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mirror the last answer, right? So you've set out the context, uh, the logic behind it. Uh, I completely agree with the logic, right? To me, if it's, it's quite common, I don't think it's normal. It shouldn't be the norm. Uh, and if it is there, it is typically the fault of the manager. I think that is a failure of a manager in, in organizing their team. That is essentially your one job, which is make everyone run towards a common goal in a way that they grow and they're happy. Because teams which are happy and growing will get better and better and better. Teams that are not happy and or not growing will get worse and split up. Right. So it's the failure of a manager if their team members are feeling like slaves. And feeling like slaves can have multiple emotions to it, right? It could be my view doesn't matter. It could be uh, the manager doesn't empathize with me, etc. Now, let me give an example of hacks around it, right? Uh, let me go anecdotal this time, uh, the way Yash usually does. I think one, one insight which I've seen a past manager that I had do really well is to ensure that we as a team were not feeling like slaves or you know just robots running in one direction. Uh, the manager solved for one thing, 
uh, one of many things of course there are a lot of things which feed into you feeling like a slave but one of the things they solved for was predictability uh, mm. the reality of our business as consultants back in the day was that there will be tough weeks there will be times when we will have to stretch on a weekend sprint hard uh, and we won't have a choice because the client needs mm. a certain outcome and i'm sure it's like that in the it industry too right especially in the services world uh what the manager realized was hey for my team i can't solve for the fact that the business needs you to be working some weekends what is the next best thing i can do they realized that our unhappiness was not with the fact that we were working on the weekend every time it was from the fact that we did not know we had to do it until the last moment there was unpredictability so the manager yeah. said that what i will solve for to the best of my abilities is that by thursday evening friday morning i will tell you mm. how much time i need you to push this weekend and why i will help you understand the context and i will give you visibility mm. so that yes you might not be the happiest that you had to work on the weekend but you also didn't land up in the spot where you had plans and you had to cancel them which was unhappiness felt not mm. heard i will also solve for the fact that you have context as to why this is happening i will be honest with you because i am in the same team as you so that you don't feel like i don't know why i'm doing this they're making me do random stuff this is all for the client yada 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 so an example of how a manager solved this well was understanding why was the team getting a bit unhappy being honest about it being honest with us that guys there's so much i can control but look i care for you and these are the things i can control and i will do my level best to fix that so that's just a story about how even in tough spots a manager can solve for maybe not the perfect answer where you're happy but they can solve for mm. uh, the slightly less than perfect answer where you understand you feel like they're listening to you and solving for you uh, that's just an example of what you know to me an example is of being a good manager versus a bad manager it's not the quantum of work often it's not the quantum it's the yeah. way in which you're managed so awesome uh, i think we can oh, oh okay spandana has been very attentive to i think okay if the last question is also there might as well take it so spandana has a great question which is you know what question should we ask exactly on show right empathy is important it's not the quantum of work it's how they bring the work out of you and how they make you feel uh, if the manager is not doing that well then to be honest they're not doing the job they're meant to do manager supposed to make the manager successful spandana what questions can we ask during managerial round to get a wholesome idea about the team and the workplace that is a fantastic question because this is so ambiguous <laughs> almost no one corrects it after you join the job you realize oh aisa hai oh ho oh, oh. should have known before uh, both good good and bad things so have you found any litmus test questions that bhavik have helped you grasp imperfectly but hmm. in sufficient detail culture hmm. in a in a management or a behavioral round before you actually say yes to them and they say yes to you in a job yeah yeah i have a list somewhere but i won't go through that whole list right now i'll try to keep it short and let me first take a step back and say what are we trying to solve for right uh, you're trying to understand what kind of a culture you're going into and the most practical way to do that is you at least to me i want to at the minimum understand two things what will my day look like and what will certain extreme situations look like if i understand a regular day or a mm. regular week well and i understand mm. that uh, the company or the management's way of dealing with extreme situations that gives me some more comfort about understanding what sort of a culture i'm getting into now the key here the prerequisite here is i have realized over time talking to different people that people often forget that an interview is not just their evaluation of you it's also your evaluation of them and if you don't land the second part then you're going in blind uh, where where you're going to get surprised later hopefully for the positive mm -hmm. often for the negative so especially mm -hmm. in things like managerial rounds or hr rounds it is okay to put the interview on interviewer on the spot like how yash frequently puts me on the spot uh, and ask them certain <laughs> uh provocative broad questions right uh, some of my preferred ones to at least warm them up and have a broader conversation uh are what does a regular day look like make it real for me uh if you had to talk about a typical week what is it going to feel like who am i going to engage with on what uh, that's where you get nuances of how many times 
are you going to be interacting mm. with me who all are going to be interacting with me what is the nature of those conversations uh what does my usual week look like right yash's favorite construct is vilo which is week in the life of i want to know week in the life of bhavik in this job before i go into that mm. right so that's that's one basic question you must ask and it is normal to ask that it is a must to ask that uh the second thing which i like to usually throw uh at people especially senior folks who i'm engaging with founders ceos etc is you know people talk about hey these are my values this is how we like to run things this is my culture mm-hmm. i want to i ask them to make it very real for me tell me three situations four situations in the past where this was mm. tested tell me a few situations mm. where this worked well and you exhibited that culture in your decision making tell me two three situations where it did not work well and in hindsight you should have dealt with it differently what that does mm. is it really puts them on the spot <laughs> uh, people mm. will usually fumble get nervous uh, mm. secondly you're forcing them to think back and you're also testing if these are thoughtful people are they really thinking mm. about their day to day are they thinking about how they want to run the company the culture the team and mm. they have to give you very real examples when i hear people talk about culture and philosophies and all that it's all well and good man give me a real example tell me when that worked mm. well tell me when that didn't work well tell me a story mm. and i found this makes people uncomfortable but some of the answers i've received have been very helpful in me deciding whether i want to join a particular rocket ship or not uh, and they've mm. been honest answers luckily uh, and that's how it should be if you feel like people are evasive on this question that's a bad sign and i'll also tell you what to do then if people are evasive around this question or give you very high level questions that you don't understand ask these same questions not to the person taking your managerial round try to find current or ex employees of that company they are the right people to ask these questions to so one forum is sure raise it in the managerial round but if you don't feel like people are well prepared responsive that's a yellow flag go test this out with people who are in the company or have been in that company before so that that's my hacky way there are there's a longer list but i don't think we have the time to go through that detail list but few nuggets which i think are the bare minimum and helpful uh, you don't want to be taking an uninformed decision you want to know what life is there what are the extremes and what is steady state those two things are very important to understand yash you've had ample time tell us your awesome answer under pressure under pressure but i will but attempt to your previous answer was super positive but thank you thank you but uh, yeah i think broadly very very similar to what you laid out bhavik but just just two hacks one is a philosophy that i have tended to believe this is not about work per se this is about transitions in life a work transition is one subset of a transition you change a flat uh, like bhavik and i are now searching for a flat it is the process that i would use to identify whether the flat is the right flat for us to get is the same fun in principle philosophy the same process that i would use to evaluate whether a company is the right company for me. because what am i evaluating i am evaluating my fit with respect to a certain space a work space a life space uh, choosing a friend choosing who to date all of that right i am evaluating fit that's the idea now evaluating fit at the very heart of it has to be the equivalent of a motion picture a movie which is to say that there are 25 situations happy situation sad situation overworked situation underworked situation taking off bereavement leave uh, work off site problem solving with founder many many situations how well do you fit all the situations in that particular workplace that's the problem i'm trying to solve through this holistic wholesome idea that you talk about on the Uh, unfortunately in a conversation you cannot get a movie the a bad conversation answer is when somebody will give you a you know how's the culture we are a very collaborative workplace yada 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 right that's the party line what you need to do is between this headline of the movie the trailer of the movie which is not even a trailer it's a description before the trailer and the actual movie you need to try to get a sense of two or three levels of examples so that even if you don't have the motion picture at 24 frames per second you have three frames of paintings in your mind okay how does a typical monday look what happens time by time how does a typical week during the closing of the financial year look how does a week during product launch look how does a week during an average time look the more specific you make the painting more number of frames of the painting that you can get the closer you will get to the movie the closer you get to the movie the more you're able to see if this movie is the movie that you want to act in or not so that's the philosophy 
specific questions come on the spot but what i have found is the general algorithm is ask a broad question of feeling that you know how does this look on a day to day or a week on week or something put a situation and then somebody will give you a party line which is quite boring and pathetic then you ask one why okay can you tell me one example in exactly how this works okay monday is crowded okay what happens in the team huddle okay typically like what is the kind of flavor can you show me people get offended they don't give you answers that's a fantastic sign to know that it's not a wholesome place to be in uh, but again step back philosophy is many questions you can ask ultimately the goal is to know the movie so you know whether to act or not the more paintings you can get the better the get to paintings don't satisfy yourself with the first answer ask two levels to it tell me more say more give me an example most likely you get to a better enough answer and hold your ground it is very very difficult to sometimes ask the damn follow up somebody says some hr says something about you know oh my god this is a collaborative work with your top side this it's tough to then ask the follow up but no ask the follow up i say what happens in the offside tell me the first day schedule they may not like you but you have to have the courage to ask that and unless you're very offensive in the request it's not an unfair request uh, they may say they don't answer they like you move on ask the next question so that's all about the painting frames fps movie philosophy but the idea is the same as what bhavik laid out which is essentially you want to get to specific situations and clarity to the extent possible and there's a running list that you can make specific to yourself you should almost always have that uh, we use that for our flat hunt so it's a 77 point checklist that Uh, Bhavik has refused to use now, but it does come in handy when he accepts that yes, it may have some value. Hopefully, that helps you, Spandana. Let us know if that gave you some clarity. Interesting. We seem to have come to the last of our questions uh, shared by the audience. Uh, this was a this was one of our at least for me personally, I thought this was one of our more interesting sessions. We got a few questions that were bounces and yeah. emails that we had to suddenly fend off and think. It made us think a lot, which is. Uh, awesome for us thanks a lot for people who dialed in and uh, made us think and made us be authentic and genuine with you uh, it was a lot of fun for for both yash and me i'm sure and yeah if you if you enjoy this kind of uh, this kind of authentic answers which are not so much about the technical work that we do daily but more about how to philosophically think about work how to deal with different situations um tune in every friday night we will try to be here every friday night Uh, next week you can see me put yash on the spot more often than uh, than he did today to me uh, i will definitely ain't gonna happen ain't gonna happen i got wait my guard covered <laughs> i'm going to surprise I'm, you I'm a kidding. lot more next week <laughs> no but exciting thank you so much guys for the questions if you if you want topics that are even more funky work banter anything frank see our bias is to give as much clarity and frankness as possible with the limited knowledge that we have we're keeping it vanilla like communication because that's what folks said they want to hear you know hear something more spicy give us those topics uh, comment on our scalar linkedin on our youtube and we'll try to do our best to uh, bring situations that are very real to help you become the best professional and the best engineer you can be and let's do one experiment maybe if you guys want that if folks want that we can maybe next time try to even bring in a little ipad and try to do some problem solving live with everyone on the call because that's sort of yash in my bread and butter right every day we see problems we try to break them down uh, and then abstract it to some philosophical answer uh, ideally so let us know what topics you want us to talk about let us know if you're interested in doing some live problem solving with us we can try that out next time awesome and now we would let you hopefully return to your lives and can return to our lives so that our work life balance does not become the topic for the next one where we crib all day so fantastic and wonderful thanks for the smile bhavik to we'll be on the spot again next time Uh, oh, bye no, bye. I'm throwing it back at you next time. See you everyone.